So guys, what is it, right? It's an acronym. Well, it stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. And there's some people out there um, that refer to this method as the Burrs method, like uh, my, my buddy Sam Prim. And it's the same thing. He just replaces the last R with an S and he makes that word scale instead of repeat. So you may have heard of the Burr method. You may have heard of the Burrs method. Uh, it's the same thing at the end of the day. It's just, do you want to use the word repeat or you want to use the word scale? They both mean the same thing in my eyes, essentially. So we're going to buy properties. We're going to rehab those properties. We're going to rent them out. And then we're going to go to the bank to refinance. And remember earlier I said, you know, the first 10 years I did it wrong. I did it slow because I needed to put down 20%. And the reason is, is when you're walking into a bank or a credit union or whatever sort of long-term lender that you want to work with, um, they are going to want to see skin in the game. And when you buy a property, they're going to want to see 20% down. It doesn't matter if you're buying that property for 50% of what it appraises for. You're buying it, you're creating new risk. They're going to typically want to see 20% down. And that 20% is on the purchase price. The appraisal is kind of irrelevant, assuming the appraised value is above, equal to or above the purchase price. Okay. But when we use the Burr method, guys, we're going to the bank. We've already bought the property, ideally with private or hard money. Okay. Somebody else's money, other people's money. So we've already owned the asset. So now when we go to the bank, assuming we've rehabbed it and rented it out already, but once you build up enough experience as well as relationships with your bank, you can kind of even bypass the whole rehab and rent it out phases. Uh, but let's not get into that. We can circle back to that. But typically, you're going to want to go through this, this flow right here. But here's the beautiful thing about this method. When you go to the bank to refinance a property, the bank doesn't look at it as being quite as risky as a new purchase. When you are purchasing a property, you're essentially creating risk. Okay. But when you go to a bank and you say, hey, I've already borrowed money from a friend, an acquaintance, a hard money lender, a private money lender, whatever. And now I just want to change who I owe the money to. I want to refinance the property. And in the bank size, and I don't really understand why they see it this way, but I can tell you that they all do. Um, they say, oh, okay, we would love to do a refinance with you, Dave. We look at this as being a whole lot less risky because they're essentially getting to piggyback on the original lender. Now, again, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because I could call up uh, my aunt or my grandma and just say, hey, I need to go borrow 100 grand, 80,000 to buy a property, 20,000 to fix it. And my aunt or my grandma isn't going to underwrite a damn thing. They're not going to pull my credit. They're not going to ask to see, you know, anything typically. They're just going to say, okay, Dave, here you go. But the bank gets to piggyback on the original banks or lenders underwriting even though that may or not, not may or, may or may not have even had any underwriting processes in place. But again, we can use this to our advantage because again, like I said earlier, we're not creating new risk, right? We're transferring risk, risk that was already created up here on this buy step. So now, because we're not creating new risk and we're not you know, asking them to help us buy a property. We already own the property and now we're just going to refinance how we're going to be structuring our long-term debt. They will say, hey, Dave, we will lend you 80% of what it appraises for. So when you're buying a property, it's typically going to be about 80, sometimes a little less, 70, 75, but let's just use 80 for simple math, percent of the purchase price. Well, guys, when we're refinancing, the purchase price is irrelevant because we already own the property. So now they're going to lend, you know, 70, 75. Again, we're going to use 80 for simple math. They're going to lend 80% of what it appraises for. That's the big difference here. So if we can buy a property at a discount and maybe even add a little bit more value during our rehab and we can be all into the property for, let's say, 75% of what it appraises for and the bank lends 80%. We can be all into an asset with no money out of pocket. That extra 5% can go cover the cost of our private or hard money lenders. Okay. And then again, last step could be repeat, could be scale, however you guys want to look at it. So let's break these steps down just a little bit more here. Buy. We have to buy at a discount and ideally with other people's money. And the reason that we want to buy it at a discount is because we should never be paying retail for properties. That's number one. 
Number two, there's no better way to get a good amount of equity on a piece of property than when you buy it. When we're rehabbing properties, we shoot to make a little bit more value out of it. But even if we put 20 grand in and it raises the value by only 20, 20,000, we haven't really gained any value there. All right. We shoot to make a little bit of value, but even if we don't create additional value above and beyond the dollar for dollar that we spend, um, we're always buying at discounts. Okay. And then of course I love using other people's money because um, it's essentially not my money, right? But there's also another reason that we wanna try to use other people's money. When we skip ahead, and I'm gonna skip the rehab and the rent process just for a second, we're gonna circle back. But when we skip ahead to the refinance process, if the bank doesn't see any money coming back to us, all right, it makes a much easier refinance because we're gonna be able to use a refinance that's referred to as a rate and term refinance versus a cash out refinance. Now, the big difference between the two is cash out means you're gonna walk away with cash. And banks don't typically like doing cash out refinances. They'll do them, but they don't typically like doing cash out refinances up to 80%. From my experience, I've done probably 40 of them, 30 or 40 of them. From my experience, they will still do cash out refinances, but they're gonna they're gonna you know clip you down a little bit. Typically, it's gonna be closer to the seventy percent of what it appraises for because again, there's a little bit more risk in the banker's eyes by giving you a check for twenty or thirty thousand dollars and paying off your your lender. So I like to use as much of the OPM or other people's money when I'm buying properties as possible. Because then when I go to get my refinance loan, the bank doesn't see a bunch of money coming back to me, even if it's not profit, right? If I'm going to put 20,000 into a rehab, but I need to get that 20,000 out, that's still a cash refinance. So I try to borrow 100, sometimes even 105 or 110% of what I need. Because if you think about it, let's say I need 100 and I'm going to pay a private money lender, let's say 5,000, that's 105. But what happens if I go to the bank and, or I go to my private lender and I borrow 110? So I borrow the, the 80 to buy it, 20 to fix it, that's 100. And then another 10. I know I'm going to have to pay that lender 5,000 at the end in interest, but I have an additional five grand now. And if I go and I do a rate and term refinance at 80%, I've essentially done a cash out refinance. I've just cashed out in the beginning of the deal versus with the bank. So there is some loopholes that us investors can kind of use to still utilize a cash out refinance. We just over borrow a little bit in the beginning. And sometimes I'll over borrow 20 or even 30,000. And I may have to bring 10,000 to the table when I go to refinance, but I have 20 or 30 extra thousand that I've already borrowed. So again, I, I'm still able to kind of utilize this cash out refinance. I just do it in the beginning, kind of a pro tip. All right, let's get back to the point here. So we're going to buy at a discount. We're going to use other people's money, guys. We're going to rehab or update, renovate, however you want to call that. But we're going to essentially make the property tenant proof, make it look nice. Now, there's a couple reasons that we're going to do this. The, the main reason is we're going to reduce the risk on the deal. Because again, when we're going in the bank for a refinance, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at the deal. They're looking at the borrower. How much risk is there? What kind of rate should we offer them? What kind of term should we offer them? Are we gonna give them a full 80% loan to value on this appraisal? Well, when we rehab a property, we're reducing the risk greatly for the bank because if the bank needs to, for whatever reason, foreclose and take the property back because we aren't making our payments, um, it's gonna be much easier for them to liquidate that property and get their money back. So number one, we're gonna rehab it to reduce the risk for the lender. But number two, we want to reduce the capital expenditures that we may have come our way over the next five or seven or even 10 years. So what we're going to typically do when we're rehabbing properties, we're going to make them look pretty, but we're typically trying to do the big things first when we're using the Burr method, right? So if a roof has, let's say eight or 10 years left on, on the, on, on the lifespan, we might even just replace it to just not have to mess with it in eight or 10 years. So typically we're doing roofs, we're doing windows, we're doing HVACs, we're doing flooring. Those things typically always come first. 
Also stack pipes and electrical, you know, like uh, panels, water heaters too. All these big capital expenditures, we're gonna try to knock out. It's gonna reduce our risk with the lender, but it's also gonna reduce our future expenses on these properties, all right? Additionally though, by having the property be rehabbed and updated and clean and new paint and new flooring and oftentimes new kitchens and bathrooms, not only is it gonna be easier to rent in terms of speed, but it's also going to um, allow us to get market rents or oftentimes above market rents. So it's gonna give us an increased rental income, but there's more folks, but wait, there's more. But also by having a updated and newly rent, newly rehab property, it's going to increase the duration of the tenants. The tenants aren't just going to want to live there for a year. Typically, they're going to want to stay for two or three or four, or in some cases, five, six, seven years, because they're moving into a property that is beautiful. It's got a new kitchen and a new roof and new windows, and it's clean and got new floors and new paint and all this stuff, right? So the rehab is a really, really big part of the process because it checks a lot of boxes. It reduces the risk, increases the rental income, reduces the capital expenditures in the next, you know, I call it immediate future, but really when I say immediate, I'm talking five, seven, 10 years, give or take. And then it also increases the duration of which the tenants are gonna wanna stick around. So all of these things are advantages to us, the investor, as well as help reduce the risk for the long-term lenders, the banks and the credit unions. Next is gonna be to rent it out. And guys, again, we're gonna rent it out at the top of the market. I just mentioned that because we've got a new, newly updated and newly rehabbed or newly renovated property. All right, next, we're gonna head on over to our credit union or our local bank. I'm not typically refinancing with you know Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America or US Bank or any of these big institutions because they're not typically gonna to wanna to do portfolio loans and they're not typically gonna to wanna to do commercial loans to small landlords. They will, but it's a pain in the butt. My favorite banks are gonna be the local banks that have five, 10, maybe 15 or 20 branches, but not a hundred, right? They're gonna be the smaller, more local banks. Occasionally we'll work with regional banks, but mostly smaller local banks. And do not discount your local credit unions. Your local credit unions love landlords because again, they're gonna be local and they're gonna be portfolio loans. And when I, when I mean portfolio loans or when I say portfolio loans, what I mean is, is they're not gonna take the loans to Wall Street and sell them off on the secondary market. They're gonna keep these assets within their business and under their roofs. And then the last R here could again also be an S for scale, it's the same thing. But really, you guys, if you do this 10, 20, 30, 50 times, doesn't have to be that many, of course, but you can create passive income, you can create wealth, and you can essentially buy yourself freedom.